That's always the way, thought Countess Mary. He talks to everyone except me. I see. I see that I am repulsive to him, especially when I am in this condition. She looked down at her expanded figure and in the glass at her pale, sallow, emaciated face in which her eyes and everything annoyed her Denisov's shouting and laughter, Natasha's talk, and especially a quick glance Sonia gave her. Sonia was always the first excuse Countess Mary found for feeling irritated. Having sat a while with her visitors without understanding anything of what they were saying, she softly left the room and went to the nursery. The children were playing at going to Moscow in a carriage made of chairs and invited her to go with them. She sat down and played with them a little, but the thought of her husband and his unreasonable crossness worried her. She got up and, walking on tiptoe with difficulty, went to the small sitting room. Perhaps he is not asleep. I'll have an explanation with him, she said to herself. Little Andrew, her eldest boy, imitating his mother, followed her on tiptoe. She did not notice him. Mary, dear, I think he is asleep. He was so tired, said Sonia. Meeting her in the large sitting room, it seemed to Countess Mary that she crossed her path everywhere. Andrew may wake him. Countess Mary looked round, saw little Andrew following her, felt that Sonia was right, and for that very reason flushed and with evident difficulty refrained from... She made no reply, but to avoid obeying Sonia beckoned to Andrew to follow her quietly and went to the door. Sonia went away by another door. From the room in which Nicholas was sleeping came the sound of his even breathing, every slightest tone of which was familiar to his wife. As she listened to it she saw before her his smooth handsome forehead, his mustache, and his whole face, as she had so often seen it in the stillness of the night when he slept. Nicholas suddenly moved and cleared his throat. And at that moment little Andrew shouted from outside the door, Papa! Mamma's standing here. Countess Mary turned pale with fright and made signs to the boy. He grew silent, and quiet ensued for a moment. Terrible to Countess Mary. She knew how Nicholas disliked being waked. Then through the door she heard Nicholas clearing his throat again and stirring, and his voice said crossly, I can't get a moment's peace. Mary, is that you? Why did you bring him here? I only came in to look and did not notice. Forgive me, Nicholas coughed and said no more. Countess Mary moved away from the door and took the boy back to the nursery. Five minutes later, little black, eyed three-year-old Natasha, her father's pet, having learned from her brother that Papa was asleep and Mamma was in the sitting room, ran to her father. The dark-eyed little girl boldly opened the creaking door, went up to the sofa with energetic steps of her sturdy little legs, and having examined the position of her father, who was asleep with Nicholas turned with a tender smile on his face. Natasha, Natasha, came Countess Mary's frightened whisper from the door. Papa wants to sleep, no, Mamma. He doesn't want to sleep, said little Natasha with conviction. He's laughing. Nicholas lowered his legs, rose, and took his daughter in his arms. Come in, Mary, he said to his wife. She went in and sat down by her husband. I did not notice him following me, she said timidly. I just looked in. Holding his little girl with one arm, Nicholas glanced at his wife and, seeing her guilty expression, put his other arm around her and kissed her hair. May I kiss Mamma? He asked Natasha. Natasha smiled bashfully. Again, she commanded, pointing with a peremptory gesture to the spot where Nicholas had placed the kiss. I don't know why you think I am cross, said Nicholas, replying to the question he knew was in his wife's mind. You have no idea how unhappy, how lonely, I feel when you are like that. It always seems to me, Mary, don't talk nonsense. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, he said gaily. It seems to be that you can't love me, that I am so plain, always, and now, in this kind, Oh, how absurd you are! It is not beauty that endears, it's love that makes us see beauty. 
it is only malviness and women of that kind who are loved for their beauty but do i love my wife i don't love her but i don't love of of by i i i i i don't know how to put it without you or when something comes between us like this i seem lost and can't do anything now do i love my finger i don't love it but just try to cut it off i'm not like that myself but i understand so you were not angry with me awfully angry he said smiling and getting up and smoothing his hair he began to pace the room do you know mary what i've been thinking he began immediately thinking aloud in his wife's presence now that they had made it up he did not ask if she was ready to listen to him he did not care a thought had occurred to him and so it belonged to her also and he told her of his intention to persuade pierre to stay with them till spring countess mary listened till he had finished made some remark and in her turn began thinking aloud her thoughts were about the children you can see the woman in her already she said in french pointing to little natasha you reproach us women with being illogical here is our logic i say papa wants to sleep but she says no he's laughing and she was right said countess mary with a happy smile yes yes and nicholas taking his little daughter in his strong hand lifted her high placed her on his shoulder held her by the legs and paced there was an expression of carefree happiness on the faces of both father and daughter but you know you may be unfair you are too fond of this one his wife whispered in french yes but what am i to do but what am what do you do 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 to to do i try not to show at that moment they heard the sound of the door pulley and footsteps in the hall and anteroom as if someone had arrived somebody has come i am sure it is pierre i will go and see said countess mary and left the room in her absence nicholas allowed himself to give his little daughter a gallop round the room out of breath he took the laughing child quickly from his shoulder and pressed her to his heart his capers reminded him of dancing and looking at the child's round happy little face he thought of what she would be like when he was an old man taking her into society and dancing the mazurka with her it is he it is he nicholas said countess mary re-entering the room a few minutes later now our natasha has come to life you should have seen her ecstasy and how he caught it for having stayed away so long well come along now quick quick it's time you two were parted she added looking smilingly at the little girl who clung to her father nicholas went out holding the child by the hand countess mary remained in the sitting room i should never never have believed that one could be so happy she whispered to herself a smile lit up her face but at the same time she sighed and her deep eyes expressed a quiet sadness as though she felt through her happiness that there is another sort of happiness unattainable chapter x natasha had married in the early spring of eighteen thirteen and in eighteen twenty already had three daughters besides a son for whom she had longed and whom she was now nursing she had grown stouter and broader so that it was difficult to recognize in this robust motherly woman the slim lively natasha of former days her features were more defined and had a calm soft and serene expression in her face there was none of the ever-glowing animation that had formerly burned there and constituted its charm now her face and body were often all that one saw and her soul was not visible at all all that struck the eye was a strong handsome and fertile woman the old fire very rarely kindled in her face now that happened only when as was the case that day her husband returned home or a sick child was convalescent or when she and countess mary spoke of prince andrew at the rare moments when the old fire did kindle in her handsome fully developed body she was even more attractive than in former days since their marriage natasha and her husband had lived in moscow in petersburg 
on their estate near Moscow, or with her mother, that is to say, in Nicholas House. The young Countess Bezukhova was not often seen in society, and those who met her there were not pleased with her and found her neither attractive nor amiable. Not that Natasha liked solitude. She did not know whether she liked it or not. She even thought that she did not, but with her pregnancies, her confinements, the nursing of her children, and sharing everything. All who had known Natasha before her marriage wondered at the change in her as at something extraordinary. Only the old countess, with her maternal instinct, had realized that all Natasha's outbursts had been due to her need of children and a husband, as she herself had once exclaimed at Otrad no, only she lets her love of her husband and children overflow all bounds, said the countess, so that it even becomes absurd. Natasha did not follow the golden rule advocated. Natasha, on the contrary, had at once abandoned all her witchery, of which her singing had been an unusually powerful part. She gave it up just because it was so powerfully seductive. She took no pains with her manners or with delicacy of speech or with her toilet, or to show herself to her husband in her most becoming attitudes, or to avoid inconveniencing him by... She acted in contradiction to all those rules. She felt that the allurements instinct had formerly taught her to use would now be merely ridiculous in the eyes of her husband, to whom she had from the first moment given herself up entirely, that is, with her whole soul. She felt that her unity with her husband was not maintained by the poetic feelings that had attracted him to her, but by something else indefinite but firm as the bond between her own body and soul. To fluff out her curls, put on fashionable dresses, and sing romantic songs to fascinate her husband would have seemed as strange as to adorn herself to attract herself. To adorn herself for others might perhaps have been agreeable. She did not know, but she had no time at all for it. The chief reason for devoting no time either to singing, to dress, or to choosing her words was that she really had no time to spare for these things. We know that man has the faculty of becoming completely absorbed in a subject, however trivial it may be, and that there is no subject so trivial that it will not grow to infinite proportions if one's entire... The subject which wholly engrossed Natasha's attention was her family. That is, her husband, whom she had to keep so that he should belong entirely to her and to the home, and the children whom she had and the deeper she penetrated, not with her mind only but with her whole soul, her whole being, into the subject that absorbed her, the larger did that subject grow and the weaker and more inept. There were then as now conversations and discussions about women's rights, the relations of husband and wife and their freedom and rights, though these themes were not yet termed questions as they are now. These questions then as now, existed only for those who see nothing in marriage but the pleasure married people get from one another, that is, only the beginnings of marriage and not its whole significance. Discussions and questions of that kind, which are like the question of how to get the greatest gratification from one's dinner, did not then and do not now exist for those for whom the purpose of a dinner is the nourishment. If the purpose of dinner is to nourish the body, a man who eats two dinners at once may perhaps get more enjoyment but will not attain his purpose, for his stomach will not digest the two. If the purpose of marriage is the family, the person who wishes to have many wives or husbands may perhaps obtain much pleasure, but in that case will not have a family. If the purpose of food is nourishment and the purpose of marriage is the family, the whole question resolves itself into not eating more than one can digest and not having more wives. Natasha needed a husband. A husband was given her and he gave her a family. And she not only saw no need of any other or better husband, but as all the powers of her soul were intent on serving that husband and family, she could not imagine and saw no interest in imagining how it... Natasha did not care for society in general, but prized the more the society of her relatives, Countess Mary, and her brother, her mother, and Sonia. She valued the company of those to whom she could come striding disheveled from the nursery in her dressing gown, and with joyful face show a yellow instead of a green stain on baby's napkin, and from whom to such an extent had Natasha let herself go that the way she dressed and did her hair, her ill-chosen words, and her jealousy she was jealous of Sonia, of the governess,
the general opinion was that Pierre was under his wife's thumb, which was really true. From the very first days of their married life, Natasha had announced her demands. Pierre was greatly surprised by his wife's view, to him a perfectly novel one, that every moment of his life belonged to her and to the family. His wife's demands astonished him, but they also flattered him, and he submitted to them. Pierre's subjection consisted in the fact that he not only dared not flirt with, but dared not even speak smilingly to any other woman, did not dare dine at the club as a pastime. To make up for this, at home Pierre had the right to regulate his life and that of the whole family exactly as he chose. At home Natasha placed herself in the position of a slave to her husband, and the whole household went on tiptoe when he was occupied, that is, was reading or writing in his study. Pierre had but to show a partiality for anything to get just what he liked done always. He had only to express a wish and Natasha would jump up and run to fulfill it. The entire household was governed according to Pierre's supposed orders, that is, by his wishes which Natasha tried to guess. Their way of life and place of residence, their acquaintances and ties, Natasha's occupations, the children's upbringing, were all selected not merely with regard to Pierre's expressed wishes, and she deduced the essentials of his wishes quite correctly, and having once arrived at them clung to them tenaciously. When Pierre himself wanted to change his mind, she would fight him with his own weapons. Thus, in a time of trouble ever memorable to him after the birth of their first child, who was delicate, when they had to change the wet nurse three times and Natasha fell ill from despair, Pierre, when her next baby was born, despite the opposition of her mother, the doctors, and even of her husband himself, who were all vigorously opposed to her nursing her baby herself. It very often happened that in a moment of irritation husband and wife would have a dispute, but long afterwards Pierre, to his surprise and delight, would find in his wife's ideas and actions the very... After seven years of marriage, Pierre had the joyous and firm consciousness that he was not a bad man, and he felt this because he saw himself reflected in his wife. He felt the good and bad within himself inextricably mingled and overlapping. But only what was really good in him was reflected in his wife. All that was not quite good was rejected. And this was not the result of logical reasoning, but was a direct and mysterious reflection. Chapter Xi, two months previously, when Pierre was already staying with the Rostovs, he had received a letter from Prince Theodore, asking him to come to Petersburg to confer on some important questions that were being... On reading that letter, she always read her husband's letters. Natasha herself suggested that he should go to Petersburg, though she would feel his absence very acutely. She attributed immense importance to all her husband's intellectual and abstract interests, though she did not understand them, and she always dreaded being a hindrance to him in such matters. To Pierre's timid look of inquiry after reading the letter, she replied by asking him to go, but to fix a definite date for his return. He was given four weeks' leave of absence. Ever since that leave of absence had expired, more than a fortnight before, Natasha had been in a constant state of alarm, depression, and irritability. Denisov, now a general on the retired list and much dissatisfied with the present state of affairs, had arrived during that fortnight. He looked at Natasha with sorrow and surprise as at a bad likeness of a person once dear. A dull, dejected look, random replies, and talk about the nursery was all he saw and heard from his former enchantress. Natasha was sad and irritable all that time, especially when her mother, her brother Sonia, or Countess Mary in their efforts to console her tried to excuse Pierre and suggested reason. It's all nonsense, all rubbish, those discussions which lead to nothing, and all those idiotic societies, Natasha declared of the very affairs and the immense importance of which she firmly believed, and she would go to the nursery to nurse Petia, her only boy. No one else could tell her anything so comforting or so reasonable as this little three-month-old creature when he lay at her breast and she was conscious of the movement of his lips and the snuffling of his little nose. That creature said, You are angry or jealous. You would like to pay him out. You are afraid, but here am I, and I am he, and that was unanswerable. It was more than true. 
During that fortnight of anxiety, Natasha resorted to the baby for comfort so often, and fussed over him so much, that she overfed him and he fell ill. She was terrified by his illness, and yet that was just what she needed. While attending to him, she bore the anxiety about her husband more easily. She was nursing her boy when the sound of Piers' sleigh was heard at the front door, and the old nurse, knowing how to please her mistress, entered the room inaudibly but hurriedly, and, as he come, Natasha asked quickly in a whisper, afraid to move lest she should rouse the dozing baby. He's come, ma'am, whispered the nurse. The blood rushed to Natasha's face and her feet involuntarily moved, but she could not jump up and run out. The baby again opened his eyes and looked at her. Yuri here, he seemed to be saying, and again Lazily smacked his lips. Cautiously withdrawing her breast, Natasha rocked him a little, handed him to the nurse, and went with rapid steps toward the door. But at the door she stopped as if her conscience reproached her for having in her joy left the child too soon, and she glanced round. The nurse with raised elbows was lifting the infant over the rail of his cot. Go, ma'am, don't worry. She whispered, smiling, with the kind of familiarity that grows up between a nurse and her mistress. Natasha ran with light footsteps to the anteroom. Denisov, who had come out of the study into the dancing room with his pipe, now for the first time recognized the old Natasha. A flood of brilliant, joyful light poured from her transfigured face. He's come, she exclaimed as she ran past, and Denisov felt that he too was delighted that Pierre, whom he did not much care for, had returned. On reaching the vestibule, Natasha saw a tall figure in a fur coat unwinding his scarf. It's he. It's really he he has come, she said to herself, and rushing at him embraced him, pressed his head to her breast, and then pushed him back and gazed at his ruddy. Yes, it is he happy and contented. Then all at once she remembered the tortures of suspense she had experienced for the last fortnight, and the joy that had lit up her face. Yes, it's all very well for you. You are pleased you've had a good time. You've had a do 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 car plil please you will had a exist oh but what about me you might at least have shown consideration for the children I am nursing and my milk was spoiled I am my elk was will say sales a said well Petty was at death's door but you were enjoying yourself yes. Enjoying, Pierre knew he was not to blame, for he could not have come sooner. He knew this outburst was unseemly, and would blow over in a minute or two. He wanted to smile, but dared not even think of doing so. He made a piteous, frightened face and bent down. I could not, on my honor. But how is Petia? All right now. Come along. I wonder you were not ashamed. If only you could see what I was like without you, how I suffered. You are welcome, come, she said, not letting go of his arm. And they went to their rooms. When Nicholas and his wife came to look for Pierre, he was in the nursery holding his baby son, who was again awake, on his huge right palm and dandling him. A blissful bright smile was fixed on the baby's broad face with its toothless open mouth. The storm was long since over and there was bright, Joyce sunshine on Natish's face as she gazed tenderly at her husband and child. And have you talked everything well over with Prince Theodore? she asked. Yes, capitally, you see, he holds it up. She meant the baby's head, but how he did frighten me. You've seen the princess. Is it true she's in love with that? Yes, just fancy. At that moment, Nicholas and Countess Mary came in. Pierre, with the baby on his hand, stooped, kissed them, and replied to their inquiries. But in spite of much that was interesting and had to be discussed, the baby with the little cap on its unsteady head evidently absorbed all his attention. How sweet, said Countess Mary, looking at and playing with the baby. Now, Nicholas, she added, turning to her husband, I can't understand how it is you don't see the charm of these delicious marvels. 
I don't and can't, replied Nick, a lump of flesh. Come along, Pierre, and yet he's such an affectionate father, said Countess Mary, vindicating her husband, but only after they are a year old or so. Now, he says his hand is just made for a baby's seat. Just look, only not for this, Pierre suddenly exclaimed with a laugh, and shifting the baby he gave him to the nurse. Chapter Xia, as in every large household, there were at Bald Hill several perfectly distinct worlds which merged into one harmonious whole, though each retained its own peculiarities, and every event, joyful or sad, that took place in that house was important to all these worlds, but each had its own special reasons to rejoice or grieve over that occurrence independently. For instance, Pierre's return was a joyful and important event, and they all felt it to be so. The servants the most reliable judges of their masters, because they judge not by their conversation or expressions of feeling, but by their acts and way of life, were glad of Pierre's return, because they knew that when the children and their governesses were glad of Pierre's return, because no one else drew them into the social life of the household as he did. He alone could play on the clavichord that Ecassez, his only piece, to which, as he said, all possible dances could be danced, and they felt sure he had brought presents for them all. Young Nicholas, now a slim lad of fifteen, delicate and intelligent, with curly light brown hair and beautiful eyes, was delighted because Uncle Pierre, as he called him, was no one had instilled into him this love for Pierre, whom he saw only occasionally. Countess Mary, who had brought him up, had done her utmost to make him love her husband as she loved him, and little Nicholas did love his uncle, but loved him with just a shade of contempt. Pierre, however, he adored. He did not want to be an hussar or a knight of saint, George like his uncle Nicholas. He wanted to be learned, wise, and kind like Pierre. In Pierre's presence his face always shone with pleasure, and he flushed and was breathless when Pierre spoke to him. He did not miss a single word he uttered, and would afterwards, with Dessels or by himself, recall and reconsider the meaning of everything Pierre had said. Pierre's past life and his unhappiness prior to 1812, of which he from broken remarks about Natasha and his father, from the emotion with which Pierre spoke of that dead father, and from the careful, reverent tenderness with which Natasha spoke of But the father whom the boy did not remember appeared to him a divinity who could not be pictured, and of whom he never thought without a swelling heart and tears of sadness and rapture. So the boy also was happy that Pierre had arrived. The guests welcomed Pierre because he always helped to enliven and unite any company he was in. The grown-up members of the family, not to mention his wife, were pleased to have back a friend whose presence made life run more smoothly and peacefully. The old ladies were pleased with the presents he brought them, and especially that Natasha would now be herself again. Pierre felt the different outlooks of these various worlds and made haste to satisfy all their expectations. Though the most absent-minded and forgetful of men, Pierre, with the aid of a list his wife drew up, had now bought everything, not forgetting his mother and brother-in-law's commission. In the early days of his marriage it had seemed strange to him that his wife should expect him not to forget to procure all the things he undertook to buy, and he had been taken aback by her serious annoyance when I... But in time he grew used to this demand knowing that Natasha asked nothing for herself, and gave him commissions for others only when he himself had offered to undertake them, he now found an unexpected and childlike pleasure in this purchase. If he now incurred Natasha's censure, it was only for buying too many and too expensive things. To her other defects, as most people thought them, but which to pure were qualities of untidiness and neglect of herself, she now added stinginess. From the time that Pierre began life as a family man on a footing entailing heavy expenditure, he had noticed to his surprise that he spent only half as much as before, and that his affairs, which had life was cheaper because it was circumscribed, that most expensive luxury, the kind of life that can be changed at any moment, was no longer his nor did he wish for it. 
he felt that his way of life had now been settled once for all till death, and that to change it was not in his power, and so that way of life proved economical. With a merry, smiling face, Pierre was sorting his purchases. What do you think of this? said he, unrolling a piece of stuff like a shopman. Natasha, who was sitting opposite to him with her eldest daughter on her lap, turned her sparkling eyes swiftly from her husband to the things he showed her. That's for Belova, excellent. She felt the quality of the material. 